John Ritter earlier was saying uh, about American citizenship and what it really means and why he was proud to be a Marine. And he talked about what is called on for us to do something and to be active as citizens to get ourselves informed, to speak out, not to let this roll over us. And I think, I hope that message comes through. Uh, certainly, these are two men who have devoted a good part of their lives uh, to trying to bring this out in us, and I think it's extraordinary having them here tonight. Uh, now we're going to have the question and answer session, um, and it will run about 30 minutes. Just a proud member of uh, Veterans for Peace. Uh, here's my question. A number of retired generals, Batiste and Odom, and even the active duty Admiral Fowler, I had a tip to the the issue of uh, illegal voters. Now, I want to support the troops as much as you do, Scott, uh, but you know, bombing civilian electric utility grids is the way I read the U.S. Constitution, Article 6, Section 2, which ties us into uh, international law. I think, I think any and all uh, actions against civilians, torture, attacks on civilians, are illegal orders. When are we going to start encouraging these troops, and as Veterans for Peace is doing, to start disobeying the illegal orders? a powerful question and a very relevant question. Uh, we, none of us want to do something that uh, furthers the violation of law, especially in times of war. We, we are all students of history. We understand the reality of the Nuremberg Tribunal and uh, what they stated the ultimate war crime to be, which of course is the planning and implementation of a um, war of aggression, a pre preemptive war of aggression. Um, War is a horrible thing. That's why I favor war prevention. I don't like war. Um, but while I understand where you're coming from, you as a veteran also know that I can't support that. You see, because as a combat leader or a former combat leader, I've been trained in what the laws of war are. And I know that I don't shoot civilians I don't torture, and unfortunately, we've headed down that direction. These are the orders that should be disobeyed, not because we tell them to, because they should know, because they've been trained to. But to say that we want our soldiers to disobey orders in time of conflict, A, puts other soldiers' lives at risk, puts civilians in America at risk because we will not prevail on the field of battle, and B, and most importantly, abrogates the responsibility of the policy makers to begin with. It's not the orders that the soldiers are obeying, it's the people issuing the orders that are the problem. And we have a responsibility to hold to account the civilian leadership of the United States military that puts our troops in this position. I think it's a dangerous shortcut to skip through the defined problem, which is the leadership, and go down to the lowest ranks. It's just like we're holding the sergeant accountable for Abu Ghraib, while the lieutenant colonel, the colonel, and the secretary of defense walk free. That's why I respect that point of view, but I, I respectfully disagree with it because I'm in favor not of holding to account the soldier. I'm holding to account the politician because that's what the Constitution demands of us. <laughs> Certainly, thank you, sir, for the question. 
that certainly is one of the more uh, difficult issues for the Americans to discuss for all of the reasons of, with which you are aware. The, the Baker-Hamilton report, which was the Iraq uh, policy uh, thing, it did make clear that an awful lot of people in that part of the world and elsewhere look at the Palestinian, the occupation of Palestine as one of the key things. And it's not too difficult to understand why, but for those of you who are having the problem, let me try this very clumsy analogy. There are women's groups in this country who care deeply about the status of women in some other country, distant, where the inhabitants are not racially, ethnically, linguistically, or any other way similar to us, but there is a Y chromosome that links American women to the women there. They are women together, and they're concerned. Perfectly understandable. But in the case of the Middle East, where the people, the inhabitants, are linked religiously, ethnically, perhaps even in a familiar family way with the people of Palestine, that linkage has a lot more to it than merely one chromosome. And they feel very strongly about what's being done to it, that perhaps a very shaky illustration would be the incredible reaction in the United States after many, many months of not paying any attention when those six American nuns were killed in Central America, you remember? Oh my God, they're killing American women. Ah. So you can ignore Palestine but at cost, at cost. The night that, uh, the day rather, that Secretary Baker and Congressman Hamilton released their report to the White House, that night uh, they came to the, uh, uh, the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington to, to brief the membership. I was invited, I was there, I wound up standing next to a retired admiral, a friend of mine who had been one of the staffers. And during one of the pauses, I, I asked him, I said, how many people, all, how many of the 10 members of that commission know anything about the Middle East? And he said, Ed, they've all been there. And I said, that's not an answer to my question. Let me try it another way. If I were to take a map of the Middle East and erase all the country names, how many of those 10 people could fill it in correctly? And he said, don't go there. <laughs> okay, well, I understand this. You ignore the occupation of Palestine at cost, at a price. But one of the phrases that you use, and I will get off here very quickly, you cannot speak intelligently about ending the Iraqi, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because that is not a conflict. A conflict is between two nation states that have borders and armed forces. That's a conflict. What you have in Palestine is an occupation. The Palestinians have no territory, they have no army, they're occupied. And you really cannot speak intelligently about Israeli-Palestinian negotiations because when the democratically elected leader of the Palestinian prisoners meets with his Jewish jailers, he does not go there to negotiate. He is the prisoner. And you can't talk about a peace process because there's no war there. So the language that we use seriously obfuscates the nature of the problem, which is one word, it's an occupation. You cannot, under the UN Charter, you cannot put your population into an occupied area. And the United Nations recognizes armed resistance to an occupation. So the question is, who's right? Well, that all depends entirely on where you stand. The difficulty that we face with Palestine is that people tend to blame us for heavy involvement in what's been going on there now for 40 years. It doesn't mean they're right, don't misunderstand me. Perception is reality. The only thing that's real is how you perceive things. And they perceive us as partly responsible for what's been happening to the Palestinians for 40 years. They don't blame us for Darfur. They may criticize us for not doing more to solve the problem, but they do blame us for that. And if you add that problem to the load carried by our operations in Iraq and in Afghanistan and heaven forfend in Iran, there are going to be 1.5 
billion people in this world who are not going to appreciate it because we're talking about Muslims and Muslims care about Muslims. partial answer to your question about this arrangement with the government of Iraq I think is reflected in a, a question that was asked of me once uh, on a television network and they said what do you think of this new American embassy being built in Baghdad and I said that's not an embassy that's not an embassy that I have any familiarity with the people who work there are crouched down behind the blast walls the barbed wire and the sandbags what kind of interface do they have with the people? How do you go out in your Humvee with the helicopters and the armed guards and the Kevlar vests and talk to the folks? And you say, say, uh, you're happy we're here? Oh yeah, oh yeah, really, I'm just happy as hell. I mean, gotta hope you stay forever. Uh, and the ambassador there, Ryan Crocker, who is a personal friend of mine, he and I served together in Baghdad when I was there. Ryan Crocker is not an ambassador, he's the proconsul. I mean, he essentially, you know, tells the Iraqis what to do. That's not the kind of embassy that I'm accustomed to, because the relationship between the United States and Iraq is that of an occupier and an occupied, similar in, in some ways to the situation in Palestine. So if we are talking to the Iraqis about having to stay forever, it will call you back to the end of World War I, when Lawrence of Arabia persuaded the Arabs to rise up against the Ottomans with the promise that they would then be made free, and were they? And no, as a matter of fact, they weren't. Britain took over Iraq under a UN mandate, sliced off uh, Kuwait as part of that. France took over Syria, sliced off Lebanon. You knew that, of course, yeah. Uh, a colleague of mine in the Foreign Service was born in, in Beirut, Syria, when his father was serving there. And we, we have left a legacy of serious problems. The Iraqis were abandoned by the British from 1918 to 1932. The British were there trying to do precisely what we're trying to do and using airplanes to bomb recalcitrant villages, ordered by Winston Churchill, the minister of the first time that they used air force against civilian targets. And they said, oh, this isn't working and they left. But it's important to remember it's important to know that Iraq, the location, has been overrun 16 different times in recorded history by the Hittites and the Sassanids and the Egyptians and the Israelis and the Crusaders and the Mongols and the Ottomans and the British and the Greeks and the Rome. Hey, they've been there. This has been done to them. You gotta think about that before you talk about staying a long time because the bullets, will not stop flying. Second part. Yeah, I here. <laughs> World, you didn't think you'd come to a WWF wrestling match, but um, it's intellectual wrestling. Um, what's going on with the permanent base? Is it a, is it a jumping off for uh, Iran or else? Of course it is. One has to put everything into historical context and understand that prior to the invasion of Iraq was the publication of a national security strategy promulgated in September 2002, which set forth the vision of the Bush administration 
globally and regionally. It said we will divide the world in the spheres of strategic national interest and we will impose our will on these spheres militarily, economically, and politically, and preemptively if necessary, with due regard primarily to the national interest of the United States of America. The Middle East is one such area. The Middle East, we say our policy is regional transformation inclusive of regime change in nations we deem to be incompatible with America's vision of the world. We listed three in that region for immediate to, uh, uh, attention. Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Assad's Syria, and of course, Ahmadinejad's Iran. But it wasn't Ahmadinejad at the time. The, the, the point is, the United States has a policy that's larger than Iraq. It's actually larger than the Middle East. You see, we seek regional transformation to achieve regional domination to achieve global domination. This is about the United States dictating to the world 300 million people, telling 6.8 billion people the terms of coexistence. That's what it's about here. And that's why it's important to nip this in the bud, because I'll tell you what, there's another term for the world envisioned by the national security strategy of the United States, and that's empire. You know, to wrap this thing up, my, my father fought in Vietnam, served there a couple times, and near the end, uh, one of the bases we built was Cameron Bay. I'm sure Vietnam veterans understand. That was a permanent base, man. That was more concrete than you ever saw. We were going to be in Cameron Bay for the next century, projecting American military power over the region. Cameron Bay was completed sometime around 1972. 1975, the flag of North Vietnam flew over Cameron Bay. By 1976, it was receiving Soviet ships. That's the fate of every so-called permanent base we install in Iraq. Because if America embraces empire, history teaches us one thing about empire. All empires fail, and most fail badly. Um, that's a, the last part of the question is, is the toughest. How do we get people in the United States to be really aware of and concerned about the fact that there's a world out there? You know, we are, we are justifiably not famous as a nation with a population that is really focused on and informed on and active on what's going on in the rest of the world. When I became the deputy director of the White House Task Force on Terrorism, this is 1985, and if you think back that far, we had the, the Bader Meinhof gang and the Red Army Brigades and the Achille Loro and the killing of former Prime Minister Moro and all the kidnappings down in Latin America, TWA 847. Terrorism was a big thing. The cabinet task force that was asked to look into this was chaired by a man named George Herbert Walker Bush, who was then vice president. And the working group of which I was the deputy director met with him and his first instruction was, we need a definition of terrorism that can be used throughout the government. Because right now every agency has its own definition. So we assigned one of the members of the working group this task. He was a Rhodes Scholar and he drafted up a nice definition of terrorism. We sent it up and it came back and said, no, 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 that looks very much like the sort of thing that we ourselves have done. <laughs> So we wrote it up again. We sent forward six efforts to define terrorism. They were all rejected. And after the task force finished its work and disbanded, Congress said, well, those will write one. You may Google it. Title 18, U.S. Code, Section 2331, gives you a definition of international terrorism. It says, and I paraphrase here, international terrorism, uh, cry, uh, threats, uh, actions, dangerous or harmful to human life, which would be a crime if committed in the United States. When these acts appear to be intended, A, to intimidate or coerce a foreign population, 
B, change the policies of a foreign government through intimidation or coercion. Or C, involve kidnapping or assassination. Do you know anybody involved in that sort of thing? <laughs> Terrorists are the people on the other side. Their people are terrorists, ours are freedom fighters.